Okay, hi there and welcome to the second of our suite of videos looking at uh, currency volatility in markets, particularly at this time of great economic uncertainty. So in this video, we're going to take a look at, again, the causes of volatility, uh, but also think about some of the ways in which uh, governments and central banks, if they choose to, might try to limit that volatility in currency markets. So what can make a currency volatile? Well, here are four general factors, if you like, that can sometimes increase the risk of or the susceptibility of a country's currency to periods of volatility. They are geopolitical instability, high dependence on commodity trade, uh, unstable monetary and fiscal policy, and also a high level of portfolio flows across borders. So in terms of geopolitical influences, uh, things like uh, the impact of trade wars, uh, international sanctions and obviously civil political conflict that can increase investor risk and certainly make a currency volatile from month to month and year to year. A second factor is high dependence on commodity trade. Many nations are highly dependent for their exports, perhaps for uh, the bulk of their exports, on primary commodities such as, for example, oil or timber or rubber or copper. And of course, it doesn't necessarily just have to be commodities. It could be the case that the country is extremely highly dependent on uh, things like tourism and travel for their export earnings. And obviously, the current global situation would have a dramatic effect on their export earnings and macro stability. Uh, currencies are volatile typically when the macro indicators of a country are hard to predict from year to year. So uh, a country may have a, a, a record of unstable volatile inflation or growth rates and also interest rates, which makes it harder for investors to uh, to put their money into a country. There's a if you like, there's an increased risk premium that might be attached to those decisions. And fourthly, uh, high and variable levels of, of portfolio flows across borders. So uh, countries, some countries are highly integrated into the world financial system. And there are literally billions, hundreds of billions of dollars and, and yen and uh, euros and pounds flowing across international markets, searching for the best risk adjusted rate of return in property, in corporate and government bonds and also in equities in shares. So countries which have a high level of portfolio flows in and out might also experience some currency volatility in the market. Let's just do a quick exercise on currency supply and demand analysis. Uh, we'll do two of these and let's see how, how you get on. So have a look at this diagram, which shows the external value of a currency on the y-axis and the volume or the quantity of currency traded on the x-axis. Now the market has changed. Have a look at the diagram and can you think of three reasons why the currency might have moved in the way that's been shown? Uh, this is a good chance to press the pause button on the video and perhaps jot down three reasons why the currency might have moved in the way that I've shown. So have a go and then put, just press play when you want to go through the, the answers with me. OK, so the currency has fallen in value. The currency supply has shifted out from, uh, if you like, CS1 to CS2. And that's caused a movement down the currency demand curve. The external value of the currency has diminished. What could have caused it? Well, there's more than three factors, but here are three. It could be that speculators are getting nervous about the economics of a country. So they start selling the currency and moving, moving perhaps into safer assets. It could be the case that the supply of currency in the market has increased because there's been a major increase in the world price of something that this country imports and has to spend a lot of money on. For example, uh, a major a country could be a major oil importer or it could be a significant importer of copper or, or importer of, of uh, foodstuffs, for example, and therefore they have to supply more of their currency to pay for that, causing currency supply to shift out. It could have been that the country is booming, that there's been a consumer boom. Obviously not at the moment, but uh, when consumers buy imports, they typically sell their own currency and eventually it gets converted into the currency from the export nation. Here's a second uh, situation. Again, have a look at the diagram. Something's happened here in the currency market to the external value of the currency. 
uh, again, again, can you think of three reasons why the currency might have moved in the way shown? Press that pause button, have a think, take your time, and then we'll go through the answers uh, in a few seconds. Well, in this case, the currency demand has shifted outwards. Other things being the same, that leads to an increase or a uh, an, uh, an appreciation, sorry, an appreciation in the external value of a currency. So what might have caused it? Well, again, many factors. Uh, here are three that I've thought of. Could be that the central bank has increased interest rates. They've increased interest rates, and of course that could lead to an inflow of hot money. It could have been that the country has been the beneficiary of an export boom. Perhaps the world price of one of their major exports has gone up. They're getting more dollars per barrel of oil they sell. They're getting more uh, dollars per tonne of cocoa that they're exporting to, to the rest of the world. So an export boom typically causes a currency to go up in value. It could be that there's been an increase or a net inflow of portfolio money coming into the currency market, perhaps on the back of an expectation of rising asset prices, be it property, bonds or equities. So finally, what might be done to reduce currency volatility? In some countries, currencies are highly volatile and there's if you have a free floating exchange, I suppose you have to you have to flow and go with the wind, which way the, the headwinds are moving a country's currency up or down. Let me take you through three possibilities. There are other ways, but these are three which I think would suit uh, suit well in a in a question. First of all, the central bank might move towards managed exchange rates. Instead of have allowing the currency to float freely, uh, based purely on market demand and supply, central bank could try to influence the exchange rate. Two main options there, there are other ways, but essentially they can go into the market and intervene to buy and sell currencies to influence the, the exchange rate. So if they want their currency to go up, they'd be going in as a, a, a buyer of their own currency in the market and selling reserves of foreign uh, currency. And of course, they could also make more use actively of their own interest rates to change the exchange rate to try and attract hot money flows. The second way is perhaps to limit the flow of capital, financial capital across countries. So they might impose currency controls uh, designed to limit the, the free flow of currencies in and out of both an economy and also a financial system. Quite a few countries still have those capital controls. They're happy for you to take money in, not quite as happy for you to take money out. And some people think that the financial system actually is making too much money and not generating enough tax. In fact, that a new currency transactions tax, sometimes called the Tobin tax, could have an effect. It, what, it, what it is, is a very small tax on every single currency trade. The bulk of currency trades are speculative uh, in the markets. So a very small tax on every currency trade uh, increases the internal private cost of currency speculation that could perhaps limit speculative volumes on a day-to-day -day basis and potentially raise a lot of tax revenues. Okay, so those are three ways. Can you think of some potential problems with these strategies to limit the extent of currency volatility. Again, maybe press the pause button and uh, have a think about what might be some problems with these policies. If you can think of one policy, uh, one evaluation point for each, that would be absolutely fantastic. So have a go. Uh, and then again, just press play uh, when you want to go through my suggestions. Well, here we go. Uh, I'm going to essentially put two evaluation points in each. Uh, so six points to make. Uh, central banks might move to manage exchange rates, yes, but does every central bank have the wherewithal? Does it have the clout? Does it have the power to move exchange rates? Many countries have central banks with limited foreign exchange reserves, for example. They may have a very small ability to move markets. And if they intervene, it might conflict trade-off with other objectives. If you raise interest rates, for example, to boost the exchange rate, Higher borrowing costs could actually cause your economy to, to slow down and impact on growth. Government might impose currency controls, yes, but if you are limiting the inflow of currency in and out of a country, that's going to make it harder to attract foreign direct investment because there's no obvious, well, there's a barrier, if you like, to the, the uh, transnational companies and investors taking their money out 
less likely, therefore, to put their money in. And uh, linked with that, it could make it difficult for a government to find the overseas investors uh, who are willing to fund their budget deficit. So that could be a barrier to introducing currency controls. And what of the Tobin tax? What of the idea that you should have a, a minute tax on the many billions of currency transactions that happen every, every day? Well, uh, in theory, yes, it should work. It could work. In practice, whenever you bring in a new tax, it encourages tax evasion or tax avoidance, uh, disintermediation. People find ways around it. And actually, it's pretty hard for a country to introduce a Tobin tax on its own. It's the sort of thing that would probably be needed to be introduced by a number of significant countries to make a real difference on the total volume of currency speculation. So there's a limit to what could be used there. But there's no reason why countries shouldn't try to do this. Either way, there we go. That's the second of our videos on the economics of currency volatility. And I hope you found them useful in terms of perhaps explaining some of the, uh, the situations that governments and central banks are finding themselves in at this time. Thank you.